Good evening, everyone. My name is Marcellus Joyner, supervisor for the Heritage Research Center at the High Point Public Library, uh, also archivist for the High Point Museum. Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, this evening, you will, we are uh, hosting a virtual program, uh, the People Not Property Project Update. Uh, Dr. Claire Heckel, am I saying that? Yes. Dr. Claire Heckel uh, will be our presenter for this evening. Uh, she's also the, the project coordinator. Um, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Claire Heckel. All right, thank you, Marcellus. Um, and welcome to our one guest at the moment, possibly more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here just to give some updates on the status of the People Not Property Project and also to kind of share some of the resources that are there for genealogists um, and historians in the Digital Library on American Slavery. So the Digital Library on American Slavery is designed as kind of an ever-growing one-stop website for digital resources related to the history of slavery, primarily in North Carolina, but some of the resources are national as well. It's made up of the Race and Slavery Petitions Project, Runaway Slave Ads Project. Um, we link to the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, uh, which is a project out of Emory, and People Not Property, which is the latest addition to those resources. So it's a searchable database of sources and images, they're freely available, no passwords, accounts, or fees for any of the material. It's been supported by a range of grants from institutions like the NEH and the National Archives. And um, this past year, we became the first digital facility in the National Park Service's Underground Railroad Network to Freedom system of sites. So I'm just gonna give a little background on each of the different elements and then show you how you can kind of search across them. The Race and Slavery Petitions Project uh, grew out of research by Dr. Lauren Schwenninger, who's a retired professor of history at UNCG. He's published a number of books based on his research. And basically he had amassed just shelves and shelves and shelves of paper copies of resources related to uh, slavery in North Carolina and through conversations with our digital projects coordinator at UNCG, they decided this should all go online. Um, so that first element was the Race and Slavery Petitions Project. It covers legal documents, uh, court cases related to enslaved people, slaveholders, and free persons of color. It contains detailed information on 150,000 individuals, from close to 3,000 legislative documents and 14,500 county court petitions. And the names of roughly 80,000 enslaved people, 8,000 free people of color, and 62,000 white people. Uh, it's national in scope, but searchable by state. You can search by name, by state, by keyword. There's a feature for browsing by subject. There's a glossary of terms and a help with searching feature. The originals are on microfilm, so they're referenced on the website, and um, you can then contact the state archives with that reference to get a copy of the document you're looking for. So in Browse by Subject, um, I look at these a little more detail, there are topics like slave ownership, um, change in slave ownership, slaves and slave management, uh, so this gets into a lot of the more nuanced histories of slavery, um, including different systems of ownership, uh, people being hired out, um, living off of plantations, uh, rights that people who were enslaved might have had. So right to assemble, right to buy and sell alcohol, carry weapons, education and literacy, as well as slaves economy. So uh, people who were skilled or had gardens might be engaging in their own sales and economic activities uh, and that shows up here. So attaining freedom is another 
subset, um, different documents. So even once a slaveholder decided to manumit or free an enslaved person, there had to be an official plea to the court to recognize it legally. Those documents uh, show up here. Free people of color as property owners, as slave owners, if they were involved um, in purchasing their own family is a, are interesting stories. They might be suing other people, being sued by people, or purchasing property. And then crime and punishment involving enslaved people or um, free people of color. We also see quite a lot here about efforts to escape slavery. Um, there's health and death, so anything dealing with um, diseases, health, social and civic life, um, marriage and women specifically, migration, population and transportation, family, and looking at specific crops. So this is the best place to find documents related to enslaved persons acquiring freedom or records related to free persons of color. And it's also an excellent resource for finding evidence of resistance, retaliation against owners, or efforts to organize and encourage rebellion and resistance. Um, this is an example of someone in Pasquotank County in North Carolina, who's described as of mixed blood but free born, who served in the last American war, so that would have been the War for Independence. Um, he was able to marry an enslaved woman named Rose, and he's seeking uh, to free her and his two sons and have them take his name. There are also quite a few petitions that show up around the time of the Nat Turner Rebellion, showing that slaveholders in North Carolina were quite fearful that a similar rebellion would occur where they were. So in Lenore, there are residents of the county who are seeking to keep black retailers of cakes and spirits out of the county. Their fear is that there's going to be seditious literature, so encouragement of rebellion information passed in cakes, in bottles. Um, uh, similar things in Bladen, New Hanover, Sampson, and Duplin, um, documenting that enslaved people around 1830 had, quote, become almost uncontrollable. They come and go when they please. If an attempt is made to correct them, they fly into the woods and there continue for months and years, um, stealing cattle, hogs, sheep. Um, so this is documentation of people joining maroon communities, basically, quite a few of whom were living in uh, the Great Dismal Swamp, but also just other um, thickly wooded, very remote places in these counties. So the North Carolina Runaway Slave Ads are a collection of advertisements um, for runaway slaves placed in North Carolina papers. So this one isn't national, it's based uh, strictly in North Carolina. But this is another example of, um, and a lot of these documents to me kind of help combat that um, happy slave narrative, that idea that um, still pops up mystifyingly today that people were somehow content under enslavement. Uh, this enslaved man named Jacob is described as having been heard by the overseer to throw out some hints that all should be free and that he saw no reason why the sweat of his brow should be expended in supporting the extravagance and idleness of any man or some words to that effect. So they're worried he's going to be spreading this idea to others uh, and warning people to apprehend him. So this uh, collection does have the images directly on the website. They can be saved or downloaded. They are from newspapers from 1751 to 1841. Um, they're still working on this project, so the goal will be to get up to 1865. And again, there are contextualizing essays and an annotated bi bibliography to aid with research. This is a really good place to find details that are usually very difficult to find descriptions of appearance and personality, literacy, trades, and other skills, um, as well as common routes of escape and hiding places or strategies of escape. Um, in this 
ad from 1773 in Wilmington. Um, two fellows are described and a woman, Will, George, and Sylvia. Will, about 25 years of age, five feet, eight inches high, of a yellowish complexion, slim made and a little knock kneed, his teeth filed and his country marks on his face. Uh, he's a cooper and a rough carpenter, so a barrel maker. Um, George is also described, Sylvia as well. Uh, what stood out to me was this description of George and Sylvia as having their teeth filed and um, George as having his country marks upon his face. So this would have been a widespread practice in West Africa. This is a photo from 1912 of some uh, Congolese men with this facial scarification and the teeth filing. So the teeth filing was seen as a beautification. Um, in ethnographic interviews, some people said that it differentiated them from wild animals. Um, so it was just kind of uh, an aesthetic practice and the facial scarification would be helpful on the battlefield for warriors to know who was on their side and who wasn't. And it was also a marker of status uh, and group membership. So this kind of reveals um, that these men would have reached probably adulthood in West Africa. Um, another description of a boy named Bev, five feet high, stout and thickly set, very large head and wears a broad grin upon his face, large teeth, white and pearly, also large feet. He can read and write a legible hand, has been seen lurking around the house of a woman by the name of Penny Ruff, aiming for the dismal swamp. Um, so these are where we get some really rare insights into just how people might have looked and acted um, in the absence of photographs. The transatlantic slave trade database is documenting voyages across the Atlantic from Africa and to uh, the majority were going to the Caribbean and South America, but they also include the coast of North America. This kind of just gives an idea of how um, as massive as the slave trade was in the United States, it was really a small part of just a mind-blowingly immense number of people who were taken from the coast of Africa to South America and the Caribbean. Um, the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database has lesson, lesson plans um, for educators, but also I find them enlightening just individually. There are image galleries, including the, the schedules of the ships, maps, um, illustrations of enslaved people and vessels. And there's a time-lapse animation that kind of shows how many ships sailing under what nation's flag left over time. So you kind of watch just more and more um, boats coming across For an example of just the jump from the 1670s to 1805, uh, which wasn't even yet the height of the transatlantic slave trade. So you can get a lot of statistics. Um, you can kind of play around with the data and get different tables. You can export the tables. There's different data visualization techniques. Um, you can kind of choose to zoom in and look at specific ports of exit. You can look at this is zooming in and looking at specific ports of disembarkment. And there's also a database of African names. So this is lists of different uh, first names and ages given for people coming on ships, often with a disembark and embarkation point. So where they got on the boat. There's also an intra-American slave trade database. So this would be looking at people who were boarded in places like the Caribbean and South America and then came to the United States uh, via those ports. Okay, are there any questions about those first three elements before I move on to people not property? Um, well, I did, uh, I did see a t statistic. Um, uh, I know most of the people who um, come to my room or the department, uh, most the majority of them concentrate on North Carolina, and I saw that that the number for um, for embark um, for those that embarked 
and disembark was um, extremely lower than Georgia and, and Maryland and South Carolina. So North Carolina, by statistically, wasn't necessarily the the hub of movement yeah, in, so, into and the slave trade. This has to do primarily with that graveyard of the Atlantic and just the fact that we don't have a very saleable coast. Wilmington is really the only deep port um, so, but a lot of people who disembarked at Norfolk and in South Carolina might have been shipped down river to Northeast or Southeast North Carolina. So yeah, I think a lot of people who are looking for enslaved people who arrived in North Carolina, those people would have gotten off a boat in South Carolina or Virginia and then been traveled either over land or river into North Carolina. Um, I think that goes along with what I've been told most of the time. Um, as I know, my family goes back to slavery, of course, in North Carolina, but then when I've been able to go a little further back, most of them, um, because most of my family is from around Forsyth, um, Ardell, uh, counties, Yadkin County, but I later found out that they basically just came across the Virginia border uh, mm -hmm. and moved further south to east um, more so um, once I was able to, you know, get closer to, you know, some of the actual slaves. So um, that kind of goes along with it. Also, um, I've heard, um, what is it, Antigua? I think it's the, the name I recall, but that there were some slaves that came um, to North Carolina from the Caribbean. Would this include things like that where you could- Yeah, so that would fall under the intra-American slave trade database. So that's within the transatlantic slave trade database. So these are voyages that would be, um, and the Caribbean would be included in the Americas. Okay. So I think the Antigua area um, is around, I forgot, it was Caswell County, Rockingham, somewhere around that area. I think that they came and then some of them are believed to be some of the first slaves that came to the old Salem area in Western Salem. Yeah, that's interesting. And and just one more question. I um you mentioned that they were still working on on some of the uh the slave ads, the that portion of the database. Would that is, is would that be um open for volunteers or people who wanted to 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 help uh help with the project in any type of way yes and that is david's project primarily david gwen okay if you were interested or knew anyone else who was interested uh he'd be the one to talk to okay so that brings us to our Current focus um, at the library is People Not Property. This is a three-year grant-funded project supported by the National Archives, uh, dealing with deeds that are in Register of Deeds offices in North Carolina. Um, so just as an example, this is a deed from Beaufort County for a bill of sale for one Negro girl named Nancy, about six or seven years old being sold by William Shaw to Joseph Ransom for the sum of $175 on August 14, 1810. Um, so working with volunteers, we've been identifying deeds that mention enslaved people. These fall between hundreds of thousands of pages of property deeds, so they're not in separate books. Um, one of the biggest tasks here has been to call through and identify the ones that mention enslaved people. Uh, we've been working with the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society and other community organizations on this work. Um, our liaison for OGS is Mr. Fred Watts. Um, he's also on the steering committee along with Marcellus. And we are supporting faculty research at UNCG as well as a and and North Carolina Central. Um, and we've supported student participation in this research as well from all three of those schools. 
We are currently working with 26 out of 100 counties in North Carolina. Um, this was just, the selection was based on which registers of deeds responded positively to an initial survey that we sent out. Uh, this is what the website will look like. We're not quite there yet. We're still working on website design and import to the database. But you will see each has a, a document number. So this would be Orange County, book two, page 188, and the first slave deed on that page. Um, and then you can also pull up a JPEG of the actual deed itself um, for reference. I am right in the sun here now. Try to move over a little bit. Um, so the slave deeds that we've documented, our initial goal was 8,900. We've actually hit close to 20,000 at this point. Counties provided us with 8,000 of those. We've had student workers identify 6,000 and volunteers have identified around 4,000. Um, we're working on transcribing them, so writing out entering all of the important searchable data into a spreadsheet or the database so that it can be searched. Um, so 22% aren't transcribed yet. We've done about a quarter of them and about half of them are partially transcribed. So this is where we also need volunteers. Um, here we're editing images so that in each, this shows um, four different slave deeds spread over two pages uh, and we want to have one deed per image and one image per deed. So if a deed carries over several pages, it'll just be one image file. Uh, volunteer William Durant has done some extensive transcription and he's written about his experience in a recent issue of the OGS uh, newsletter. Um, he single-handedly transcribed all of Brunswick County. I think it was something like 2,500 deeds. Um, so a very dedicated uh, volunteer. We've also had some articles in the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal. Um, Faye, you mentioned movement from Virginia. This is something we found in Surrey County that we were able to trace the movement of um, we started working with just some deeds about a woman named Charlotte and Patsy and all of these disputes between all of these heirs of this woman named Amelia McKinney. And there were several deeds where they were arguing over who gets what part of the estate. Um, but we focused in on this family and found a book about their family history. And by working with those deeds found out that they, you know, they were one of the founding families in Grayson County, Virginia. Um, it was fashionable in the 50s and 60s for a lot of these genealogists to write these big books about how important their families were. There was kind of a side note about a woman named Granny Beck and a woman named Amy who were kidnapped in Africa and had told the family their story um, and then were purchased in Richmond. So Amy had 18 children and each of William Bourne's children was given two of Amy's children. So this way we were able to construct um, four generations of this enslaved family um, and get back to the African connection. Um, but that's uh, just more evidence of that kind of movement from Virginia down into North Carolina. Got some repeated. Okay, so anyone who wants to assist with, I'm trying to run from the sun. Uh, assist with the volunteering can work 100% online. Um, we're in full on transcription mode now. And I'll move on to the um, interface that we have in development for searching. Uh, this is what it will look like. You can type in keywords or names and actually search across all of the elements. So you don't have to go into the individual elements if you're looking, for example, for a name. So this is what it looks like currently. You can already do that. Um, you can, and the link is up here, library.uncg.edu slash slavery. Um, so as an example here, I've just put in the name Sarah and said I want to narrow it down to 1840 to 1849 and look for enslaved people in North Carolina. 
so this brings up, this is just a screenshot. I think there were 25 results, but there's a deed from Buncombe County involving a woman named Sarah and her children. There's a court petition with a dispute over division of property. One of the enslaved people is named Sarah. So this is one of the, I think, more useful features for genealogists, is that if you've got a name and a rough date and a rough area, you can start pulling up uh, documents that might be related to the person you're looking for. Um, and that's just the current the, the current way that it's working. You're, you're yeah. looking to get more expansive as things develop. Yes, so things are just getting, this is already fully searchable for everything but people, not property. Um, we are wrapping up the project in September. So by September, all of the deeds should also be fully searchable. Um, but as you see, there's a Buncombe County one. So as we get our counties completed, they're getting dumped into the big database to be searchable. And I also just wanted to give a plug to Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy, if anyone's not aware of this. Um, I have attended a couple of meetings. They usually meet on Sundays. You can find them on Facebook. Um, it's run by Renata Yarborough Sanders and Tania Kuntz. And it's just an interest group um, of North Carolina genealogists kind of talking each other through issues and resources. Helping each other break brick walls. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that will conclude my presentation on the DLAS. Are there any questions?